could happen. So one year of planning is boiled down to three days. Nearly 450 attendees from four countries and 17 states, Australia, Canada, India, and New Zealand, including students from the NTOC Heritage Academy in New Delhi and the Historic Preservation Program at the University of Florida. We hope you enjoyed this conference with 25 sessions, over 90 speakers, three special presentations with nationally recognized speakers, and two very special cocktail hour events, Wicked Sacramento and Tiki Time. Good evening and good morning and welcome to all of you out there. I'm Christine Lazaretto, the president of the Board of Trustees. We're thrilled to be able to present this online version of the conference and wanna thank you all for joining us. We are grateful for your participation and to have these three days together to share our ideas. We hope to present you with thought provoking and challenging issues and ideas, but also provide a sense of community during this time when we can't be together in person. I want to thank the conference committee for all of their hard work over the last year to bring this conference to life. And in particular, I want to thank William Berg, steering committee chair, and Christina Dykus and Susan Lassell, program committee co-chairs. And we, of course, want to thank and recognize all of our speakers for sharing their work and their thoughts on this changing world for the next three days. I would like to thank all of our annual sponsors who make the work of CPF possible throughout the year. This includes critical support for our programs, along with our ongoing advocacy and education efforts. And our conference sponsors whose contributions make this event possible. This year in particular, this support has meant so much to the organization and we're grateful that all of our sponsors stayed with us as the Sacramento conference was postponed and all the content was transitioned to this online platform. Thank you to my fellow board of trustee members for all of their hard work and dedication to CPF and for their collaboration over the last several months to help guide CPF through this unique moment in history. And finally, I wanna thank our amazing staff. Cindy Heitzman, Executive Director, Jonathan Haber, Field Services Director, and Christine Madrid-French, Development and Marketing Director. It's due to them that we're able to be here with you today. I wanna to recognize their tireless efforts over the last few months. Cindy said it was a smooth transition, but it was certainly due to an awful lot of hard work. And I wanna thank them for their grace, creativity, and humor. And with that, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, author and journalist, Anthony Flint, Anthony is a senior fellow at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, a global think tank based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's been writing about urbanism and sustainability for many years as the urban design critic for the Boston Globe, a correspondent for City Lab, and as contributing editor for Landlines, the Lincoln Institute's quarterly magazine. He's also the host of the Land Matters podcast. Thanks to Anthony for joining us and setting the stage for a changing climate for preservation. Thank you, Anthony. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here uh, to get things started in your virtual proceedings and uh, some virtual keynote remarks. Um, I was planning to be there in person, of course, um, and indeed focus on two crises. And here, let me just share my screen and the PowerPoint. Just one moment. All right, well, you see by the title, it's uh, uh, concerning uh, overlapping uh, crises. I uh, wanted to focus on two crises at first, climate and affordability, uh, to suggest that that have become important context for your work. But now nobody can physically be there, and I've added a third crisis <laughs> accordingly. So uh, let's see how it goes. We begin with the climate crisis. Um, this needs li little explication for this group. Um, but 
Here's an update just from last month. Um, researchers reported that April of 2020 has tied for the hottest April on record. And there's a 75% chance that this year will become the hottest one ever measured for the globe as a whole. The carbon in the atmosphere just keeps accumulating and also set a new record this month, topping 418 parts per million for the first time in 3 million years. Next, something California and all of you uh, know all too well, the lack of affordability in living and working in so many of our communities for vast segments of the population. Up until this spring, we've seen a remarkable boom in cities uh, fueled by innovation and commerce and a perfect demographic storm. Aging boomers, millennials, less need for space, more appreciation of walkable, transit accessible urbanism. But the problem, of course, the persistent problem is what Jane Jacobs called over success. Unaffordable housing, gentrification, displacement, evictions and homelessness. Hot market cities are confronting an extraordinary affordability crisis. It's cheaper to live in Madrid and commute by plane to work in London than it is to live in London. And now the pandemic. Those disparities have been starkly revealed by the coronavirus pandemic. The seismic disruption triggered by the outbreak looks like it'll be with us for a long time. 37 million Americans have filed for unemployment and the unemployment rate currently stands about nearly 15%, on a par with the worst of the Great Recession of 2008. Goldman Sachs thinks it might peak at 25% and that the GDP might shrink by nearly 40% in the next quarter. That, of course, is something not seen since the Great Depression. While white collar workers can work from home, lower and middle income families have been hit the hardest. Massive deficits already are projected for state and local budgets. For cities, the basic building blocks of a functioning economy, office workers, residential growth, higher education, restaurants and retail, of course, sports, cultural festivals, and other amenities have all been wiped away. A fear of density may increase the lure of suburban sprawl, worsening the climate crisis, and so on. This kind of mind-blowing overlapping uh, is a big part of the current context for historic preservation and all the work that you, that you all do and the business of this annual conference. Many of you are dedicated to the straightforward task of predict, pr protecting landmarks and cultural heritage. And while the cause has always been complicated and taxing, from now on, I will argue, these triple emergencies will become the context for virtually every aspect of city building. Creativity, flexibility, and compromise are likely to become valued skills as never before. Well, a backlash has been building for a while now on just those two fronts, sustainability and affordability. Let's reacquaint ourselves with the arguments for relaxing some restrictions, say, uh, triple glazed windows or solar panels on buildings in an historic district, given the urgency of the climate emergency. The basis for this argument is that climate trumps everything. That if the planet descends into mayhem later this century, things like the appearance of copper drain pipes really won't matter much. There's actually similar contention within the environmental movement itself. Uh, to stop obsessing on obscure endangered species, for example, or to spend so much time on recycling, as important as that is, and to focus on the big stuff, reducing emissions and building resilience. A snail darter might die, but there's an existential threat out there that requires all hands on deck for a more single purpose. Some similar tensions with various efforts to address the urgent need of more housing and more affordable housing. The ambition of more height and density at transit stations, which many point out uh, also does double duty in terms of sustainability in the environment. 
tends to stir opposition from many quarters, including established residents who've been labeled as NIMBYs, or not in my backyard. A variety of legitimate concerns here, uh, which no one would diminish. But my point here is this, the increase of housing supply at smart locations is a policy that has had quite a lot of urgency behind it. It's not coming out of nowhere. On its face, it's one response to an urgent need. Many are urging to reassess what the trade-offs actually are here, particularly ex regarding extensive vacant industrial or underutilized urban land near transit. So what's a preservationist to do? What are the possibilities for a more agile navigation of all of this? Well, come back me, uh, I invite you to come uh, with me back uh, through time for a moment, about a half century, and let's revisit a heroine, Jane Jacobs, regarded as a champion of historic preservation, but not always remembered accurately for what she said about preservation in cities. No question, she led some pivotal battles. She saved Greenwich Village from slum clearance, and we're all glad she did. This is one of my favorite pictures uh, from my book. Uh, it's from the late 50s. It's a ribbon tying ceremony. Uh, no grand public works celebration for politicians here. Uh, they usually cut the ribbon. Uh, these children, uh, including uh, Jane Jacobs' daughter, is uh, tying the ribbon. Uh, in this case, it was uh, against a four lane, a proposed four lane roadway through Washington Square Park. She also saved Soho and the cast iron facades of the palaces of trade there, uh, all along Broom Street, and we're glad she did. Moses dubbed Soho, before it was known of that, uh, known as that, of course, as Hell's Hundred Acres and sought to build a 10-lane elevated highway, the Lower Manhattan Express. That was one of uh, actually four crosstown expressways he envisioned, the Cross Bronx Expressway, uh, the only one that was actually executed. I think on the whole, we can agree that this was a bad idea. Uh, the destruction of the fabric of the city couldn't possibly be justified. You can see where I'm going with this, Compared to today's debates about more targeted redevelopment for housing and sustainable development, this was an easy call. The inspiration of the movement Jane Jacobs led was so powerful and so wonderful, but it's been so potent, it surged on long after some of the original wrongs have been righted. The passions continue to be intense, almost to some observers, regardless of the actual circumstances. In this view, a fight against bad ideas has become a fight against all change. Well, let's remember what Jane Jacobs actually believed, that cities were constantly evolving, responding to different needs and times, and that no neighborhood should be frozen in amber or kept under glass. Her mantra was also new ideas for old buildings, ultimately turning today what we all know and recognize and embrace as adaptive reuse. If modica modifications were necessary, that was okay. She wouldn't endorse the facotomy or saving elements of the built environment in an absolutist, uh, absolutist stance. The point underscores the wonderful complexity of this courageous woman. Most people think of Jane Jacobs as have, of saving old buildings and derailing the march of 20th century modernism. And indeed, the cover of my own book shows her out on the picket lines, white gloved, pleading in vain to stop the demolition of Pennsylvania Station. She's the mother of three, defiantly standing in front of the bulldozer. But she never dug in completely. She liked the Seagram's building, for example. Mies masterpiece and the icon of the modern. Uh, I like this delicious twist, by the way, that um, in the world of historic preservation um, in the 21st century, that 20th century development, seen not so long ago as the threat to all things historic, is being awarded the laurel wreath of landmark status itself. For Jane, it was the diversity that was the thing. 
I'm speaking to you from New England and in places like Beverly and Salem on the North Shore here, in downtowns and town centers and neighborhoods served by transit, we're seeing infill redevelopment and multifamily housing that is respectful of the historic fabric and char character of the area. Climate-friendly overhauls are also de rigueur. This is Harvard's net zero house, a retrofitted circa 1940s structure. One of the places I was most excited about visiting had I been able to physically be in Sacramento was the warehouse artist loft, which looks to me to be a textbook example of adaptive community. New ideas in old buildings. My argument is that this kind of blended approach and policies that serve multiple aims will only surge in demand in these times. The rallying cry has already begun for a more equitable rebuilding and a green recovery. On the climate and housing front, it promises to be more than a mere redoubling of efforts and hints at something more transformational. So as you continue your virtual discussions over the next three days, I think you'll find yourself immersed in this new context and these new realities. It'll require even more creative thinking, flexibility, and perhaps a little compromise and empathy as we all confront the triple emergencies of climate, equity, and this insidious lethal virus. So thank you for listening, and now we've reserved some time for questions. I believe Chris French and John Haber are going to moderate, so I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it over to them. Hey, Anthony. Thanks for the uh, talk. I've been typing with some of the, um, of the audience members. And John, do you want to see if anyone's already come up with some questions? Yeah, I'll just <clears throat> remind everybody to um, use either the chat box or the Q&A box. We're both going to be keeping an eye on it. Um, the first question that came through, I'll, I'll be the first one to read this, and then Chris can take the next one. <laughs> Um, interested in hearing what you think the impact will be on small business and Main Street type programs. Yeah, we, we, uh, uh, we do a lot of work with uh, legacy cities, um, you know, places like Detroit and, and uh, especially smaller uh, post-industrial cities like Hartford, Connecticut or uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania or Youngstown, Ohio. And one of the things that we recommend um, which you will be well familiar with is um, building on a sense of place. So in downtowns and uh, town centers, um, building on the bones of urbanism. Now this means uh, the elements of a downtown, which are very much commercial or mixed use, um, the small businesses, the retail, the restaurants, um, all of that is up in the air now. And indeed, in places like Detroit, which arguably was r right on the brink of a rebound, uh, those, those kind of like basic building blocks of city building, uh, it's, it's not available. Um, I think there's going to be uh, continued support for keeping small businesses open. Uh, I, I think it'll be a, a, an uphill battle. I'm not sure how, how long the support is going to enable people to survive. Um, I think there'll be a lot of attrition, and there certainly won't be any new restaurants uh, opening up, which is exactly what some of these downtowns uh, need. Um, and in hot market cities, unfortunately, I, there, there's, a, there's a growing perception that some of the mom and pop businesses uh, will indeed uh, go under, and um, sort of larger corporate entities are, are ready to to swoop in um, uh, and uh, take advantage of low prices and, and, and vacancies and so forth. So that, that is a dark picture um, and I, I, I wish it was different, but that's going to be the challenge for, uh, you know, trying, trying to confront that with, with sensible policies. 
Thanks. I had a, I have a burning question of my own first, uh, Anthony, and then we'll have another one that I want to read from one of our friends here. I was wondering how you see, with the, in consideration of Jane Jacobs and her work, that more and more cities are actually closing off their streets uh, to cars entirely since it's been so quiet, and then allowing pedestrians to sort of take over, partly for uh, increased social distancing. But what do you see as the, as the beneficial effects? I think it's Seattle has actually closed some streets permanently at this point. Yeah, Seattle, uh, Berlin, New York City, uh, Oakland in the Bay Area. Uh, their uh, uh, Mayor Libby Schaff is uh, building on this Slow Streets initiative, which began before the pandemic. And uh, I think this is one of the uh, good things to uh, come out of this crisis. Um, obviously, encouraging uh, bicycling and pedestrians and scooters um, is an appropriate uh, uh, mode of transportation that involves inherently uh, social distancing. The, the, the question of mass transit in cities is, is so thorny uh, because the, of the reduced capacity, um, as much as 50% for a subway car or a bus. I mean, like, how do you social distance on a bus? So these other modes are gonna become uh, more and more important, and we should be glad for that uh, because of the environmental benefits. And of course, in, in a larger sense, we've seen uh, clearer skies and reduced emissions uh, through, through this lockdown period. So it's been encouraging to see that some of the things that made sense in lockdown will carry over uh, into our new future. Great, thanks. I have one uh, here, and then I'll let John take the next one. Uh, do you think public opinion still considers historic preservation as averse to change and compromise? And how can we convey the message that we've been compromising all along? Well, I, I you know, this is a this is a great question. Um, uh, as I uh, hinted at in in my remarks, uh, the the business of historic preservation is, uh, you, you, it, it's been tough. And um, th there, there's a, a reasonable approach here uh, that says, you know, we're, we're done compromising because um, you can't just keep compromising. You can't keep uh, making exceptions, for example. Uh, and and um, the, the policies uh, for historic districts um, have had to be tough. Uh, because, you know, they're, they're constantly under fire. So I'm, I'm very sympathetic. Uh, I do think that um, the, you know, the Ed Glazer argument that um, uh, historic uh, preservation and historic districts in, in hot market cities uh, are, uh, you know, are preventing con housing construction and so it's keeping people away. Um, and uh, I do think that there is a perception that sort of like historic preservation for, for whom um, and uh, whether it is um, sufficiently sensitive to the needs of, uh, of lower, lower income families. So I do think that perception uh, uh, persists, um, but I'd be interested to hear more about what people think about um, being uh, co compromising enough already uh, because I do think that that you you have had to be tough uh, and really d dig in um, over the last at least half century um, I guess the suggestion is that is that you know the, these are new times and new new realities so I really like this question so I would, I'm gonna pick this one even if nobody else wants me to ask it so um, what do you see in Jane Jacobs' work that speaks to affordability and preservation that you think we can apply, still apply today? Yeah, that's another good one. Uh, that indeed is uh, sort of one of the enduring critiques of uh, Jane Jacobs' work um, is that Greenwich Village, which she saved, uh, it was, it was, nobody can afford to live there. It's um, one of the most expensive places uh, on earth. Um, and she anticipated that. Um, and she called it 
over success and described it in different ways, she recognized that good urban environments uh, were very quickly going to become very popular. Um, and uh, she sought to respond by increasing the supply of housing, uh, but in, in a more uh, moderate approach or more measured approach. So uh, she was involved with a, a state-run housing project in the West Village um, that uh, was lower density, uh, uh, buildings of uh, uh, six to eight stories. Um, and, you know, the, the critique was that uh, that's just a drop in the bucket and that what Robert Moses was doing was more heightened density and nobody likes the towers in the park, but what he was responding to was the need for an increased supply of, of housing to uh, uh, take into consideration the basic laws of supply and demand and in, in, in economics. So uh, there was that tension, this idea that neighborhoods like Greenwich Village, um, I mean, they're wonderful, they're quaint, they're, they're preserved, uh, but that there's uh, kind of a boutique quality um, to it, and especially if you consider global urbanization, um, that a number of Greenwich villages all around the world is just just not going to cut it. So uh, she had um, more work to do on gentrification. Although throughout her life, she 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 recognized how um, uh, affordability was going to be a problem in cities. So before I turn it over to Chris to ask a question, I just wanted to encourage everybody to use the raise hand function because we would love to have people ask uh, Anthony questions in person. Uh, so if you use that function, I'll be able to enable your voice. It looks like somebody just did that. Should I, uh, should I have this person ask this question? Sure, let's see what they got. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to allow Allison to talk. And Allison, all you have to do is enable your microphone. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Hi, Allison Rose Jefferson from Los Angeles. I'm a, a public historian and heritage conservation consultant. So how do you see, um, uh, we're here on the West Coast in California. How do you see Jane uh, uh, Jacobs' uh, thoughts on um, preservation in a place where Urbanism is different than the context that she was writing in in uh, New York. And so we have some density that's vertical, but we have a lot of density that's horizontal. So what are your thoughts on the applications of her uh, philosophy here in contemporary times? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, places like LA uh, actually uh, by some measures, uh, one of the most dense places uh, in the country. Um, it, it, I think the discussion of density will uh, be front and center for a long time to come, and it's been intensified uh, by uh, the pandemic. Um, and uh, the basic ingredients of a successful urban neighborhood for Jane uh, was um, was pretty much all in all in her handbook, her owner's manual. Uh, mixed use, diversity, um, uh, more human scale development of, uh, say, brownstones of five or six stories, um, ground floor retail, um, and uh, I, I think that landscape is applicable to places like. Uh, LA with the different uh, uh, nodes uh, and um, uh, concentrations of, of density in, in the various neighborhoods and, and the town centers and downtowns of those neighborhoods. And with the absolutely uh, critical element of being connected by transit. Um, so uh, I, I think what LA has been discovering is, is uh, just how this sort of polycentric you know, set of urban villages uh, can actually uh, can actually work, um, and you might begin with downtown Los Angeles, but uh, all of the many other neighborhoods, um, 
you know, play a role in that sort of more polycentric uh, urbanism, which I think Jane Jacobs would support. Thank you, Allison. All right, um, I have one, uh, Anthony. Uh, we do have some students and um, our, some of our colleagues are tuning in from uh, New Delhi, India, and we have a question from there from the Intac Heritage. Uh, with urbanism, cities tend to grow, which most of the times result in naming cities as old and new. For example, Old Delhi and New Delhi. So should we preserve old cities as by freezing them to an era and then let the new cities grow? So would you have sort of one that you keep sort of encapsulated and then grow in another section? I know this has been something that Jane Jacobs was involved with, um, same with Robert Moses and modernists in particular. Yes, well, when we think about global urbanization uh, and uh, these uh, vast uh, growing cities, um, you uh, have to look at the concentration of people and primarily poor people in the developing world at the periphery uh, of these uh, incredibly large cities and uh, also of uh, informal settlement, which by the way, Jane Jacobs actually ha had uh, some positive thoughts about uh, the way that informal settlement um, organically uh, comes together was something that she was very much interested in. Um, and uh, the, the uh, problem though is that these areas um, are, are just not sustainable because there are inadequate basic services, sanitation, electricity, and, and so forth. Um, and, and so there's, there's a lot of suffering. So uh, we can't really, we have to be careful not to romanticize uh, these, these aspects of, of informal settlement. In terms of the uh, historic city center, uh, that again, you know, has had this incredible commercial value, um, and uh, you know, I think all many of you are on guard against this idea of, you know, um, a, a sort of a faux historic uh, character or you know, sort of ye old uh, Delhi uh, or wherever it might be, um, but uh, height restrictions and other measures uh, completely appropriate uh, for historic uh, downtowns and, and, um, and other areas in big cities like that. But, the, but the, 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 the bigger picture, there's the bigger picture that I'm suggesting needs so much attention, and that is issues of equity uh, and uh, environmental degradation and sustainability in these fast-growing cities of the developing world. John, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have another person asking a question through the phone line, so I'm going to um, enable uh, James Papp, and he has a question for you. James, can you, um, can you hear us? Okay, maybe his uh, mic isn't working. I'm going to uh, try another question from Carrie. And Carrie, I just uh, enabled your mic. Okay. <laughs> uh, I might just see still on mute. I'll ask another question of Anthony while we're waiting to tee up some other people. Um, we have one from Adrian Scott Fine. He's with the LA Conservancy and he's also on our board of trustees for CPF. Uh, he says, can you talk about density and how we reconcile with the long tradition of val valuing density in cities while some now use greater density and housing production arguments to demolish less dense historic neighborhoods and commercial corridors. So how are we able to reframe the argument as a, as a both and instead of an either or in terms of density and housing? Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good impulse, uh, both and um, rather than either or. And I, 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 I my sense is, is that, um, a, a, a reassessment of what the actual uh, threats are uh, uh, and uh, what the trade-offs might be on the ground uh, is, is, is warranted. Um, 
for, uh, and we don't need to just focus on California, it could be any place. One of the things that I've uh, been amazed by is that, let's say you have a parking lot uh, or a gas station uh, near a transit station. Um, I, I think it, it does make some sense that that is an appropriate place for, for height and density and, and nothing is um, being, being taken away. Um, it's just a parking lot. Uh, so um, in those instances, uh, I, I think that the redevelopment of urban land um, is uh, you know, an, an appropriate target for this increased supply of housing uh, you know, to address this, this crisis that I, that I talked about. So I'd be interested to learn more about the, um, the, the actual uh, threat to uh, uh, structures and neighborhoods um, and, and, and focus on uh, just around transit stations uh, to, you know, to really to really look at that and see uh, and see what uh, the 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 dangers are to um, you know that that historic fabric. I I I put I showed a slide of uh, Beverly, Massachusetts, and tried to suggest that there are a lot of smart people thinking about how to how to blend new development and multifamily housing into the historic character of a of a given neighborhood. That's great. Um, I have a, a question that uh, pertains to the time that we're living in right now. As a humanities scholar and an author, I have this is sort of a two part. One comes from uh, one of our audience members, Sean. Uh, it's about, you know, COVID has shown that many employees can work effectively from home, like we're not even going into the office anymore. Uh, do you think this will create a unique opportunity to reuse underused office space for residential use in city centers? And then slash, how are you looking at uh, the current situation as a writer and how you might be interpreting that uh, today as we go along? Yeah, I, um, the, the, the workplace uh, and office space scenario is, is, is really tricky um, in, in some sense. Uh, companies might seek a, a, a bigger floor plate and, and more space so that they can spread out, um, but the more likely, I think, especially in the short term, the more likely uh, choice will be to continue to let workers work remotely um, and uh, get business done by other means online, just like we're doing here. And I think interestingly, that might open up, that might ultimately take some pressure off of hot market areas like uh, LA or San Francisco or the Bay Area. Um, because if we think about a bigger uh, catchment for uh, uh, the labor and housing markets, um, people can work farther away from the urban core uh, and when they need to get in, the, the key is how they get in when they need to when they need to come in and and work face to face. So uh, I think one way to look at this that is helpful um, is I, I wrote something about, um, uh, and this addresses the second question. I wrote a, an essay for City Lab about uh, mega regions and thinking uh, in terms of a more regional approach to how. Uh, urban economies actually function. So you take the Northeast, or just take the just take uh, New York to Boston corridor. Um, places like Hartford, Connecticut, might become more prominent as a more affordable uh, uh, alternative. And if there was a way, say through high-speed rail, uh, to get quickly to Boston or New York. Um, that would make it just as good as living on the Upper East Side or uh, in some of these gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, and uh, the regional approach, I think, is being embraced already because you see the governors of these many states coordinating on uh, the recovery. Um, uh, you know, they're looking at things as simple as, well, if we keep this beach closed and then across the border, another beach is open, you know, how is that gonna work? So 
uh, it, it's been another byproduct, I think, of this crisis that uh, regionalism may may have a new moment, and there might be more recognition that it really is a, a very sensible framework uh, to look at uh, the recovery and and beyond. Um, uh, final point, uh, I, I would direct you to, uh, this was in the City Lab essay, but uh, uh, the work that's going in uh, on in Northern England, uh, it's called the Northern Powerhouse Initiative. And um, this is improving the uh, higher, higher speed rail infrastructure, connecting post-industrial cities in the north of England. Um, and so these kinds of transformations uh, may, may well uh, come out of this. <clears throat> um, I have a question. I, I, um, I'm, I'm merging about eight questions that came in through the Q&A box. So it's really a, a question from almost eight different people. So, um, and, and I'm going to try to paraphrase. That's not fair. <laughs> as much as possible, I'm going to try to paraphrase what, what is in all of these questions. But all of them really have to do with the ecological uh, impact um, of uh, demolishing buildings, but also vice versa, saving buildings in terms of um, the embodied energy in these buildings, and sort of the ecological argument for historic preservation. Um, and they're also asking questions about resiliency and climate change and all of these bigger issues that um, tie into historic preservation, which of course, as you know, is the theme of the conference this year. So. I think what they're all curious about is how do you make that connection? What can you do to argue for historic preservation from an ecological uh, standpoint? Well, I think it's a very powerful argument, the um, embodied energy uh, argument. Uh, I recall that um, it, it was uh, brought forward to great effect in uh, a uh, debate we were having here in Boston about uh, the Boston City Hall. Um, and uh, there, there were uh, plenty of arguments for and against, but uh, uh, one, one that gave a lot of people pause was, well, you know, what, what is gonna be involved with actually demolishing this thing? Um, so, and, and of course, you know, is, is, would it be worth it? What's the trade-off? Um, so I think that's a powerful argument. I also think, as I suggested in the remarks, the um, uh, adaptive reuse and uh, net zero buildings uh, going into abandoned factories and making them maker spaces and making them, you know, t totally LEED certified and, and green um, uh, bolsters the, the, the cause in some, some important ways. Um, I guess what I'm a little bit worried about is is the bigger picture. Uh, so uh, a project like that is is fantastic, but the bigger picture is um, increasing housing supply and uh, uh, doing uh, rede urban redevelopment and infill uh, at transit stations uh, with with greater height and density, especially on vacant land. Um, that that's that speaks to the bigger picture, not only to the housing crisis but to the climate crisis. More people using transit, uh, living in a compact setting, uh, of course, is very energy efficient as well. Cities are actually one of the most energy efficient places per capita, as you as as you all know. Uh, so um, the. The way I see it, uh, there's a little bit of a sort of, you know, one, uh, a one-off projects uh, versus uh, a bigger picture of sort of like statewide or citywide policy on urban redevelopment uh, to uh, uh, develop um, sustainable practices and, and of course, uh, resilience. Um, resilience is, 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 a, is a tough one. Um, if you know so much humanity is is uh, hangs in the balance, um, uh, you you I think will hear this argument that again climate trumps everything else. So that um, if uh, uh, resilience measures uh, requires altering 
the urban landscape, uh, including potentially historic properties or, or uh, parks or other things like that, um, you know, the, 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 um, the more urgent need and the fact that if we don't do anything, some of these areas will be underwater, you know, I think it's, it's going to start to carry the day. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, on, in a similar vein, uh, we have a few questions about um, how can preservationists uh, work towards protecting uh, the regulations that, that we rely on right now as, as people become, you know, the economy might fall down and, and things become more greater disarray. How do we make sure that those uh, rules that we've been working so hard to protect for the last 50 years uh, stay intact? <laughs> Well, boy, that's a, that, that is a great question. Um, I think uh, there are gonna be uh, many uh, challenges, many tensions. Um, these overlapping crises uh, are, are gonna bring a lot of, uh, you know, power and uh, a sense of urgency to bear. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, I go back to this uh, debate that, uh, is actually within the environmental movement uh, and uh, to um, uh, focus less on uh, certain things, uh, endangered species, uh, perhaps uh, some uh, regulatory uh, processes um, that, uh, uh, you know, maybe there are ways to uh, streamline them to uh, build important infrastructure faster. Uh, I think you will see uh, some of those pressures uh, mounting. And um, I think it, it could be a good thing or a healthy thing if uh, we all kind of like take stock uh, about uh, what certain uh, environmental regulations and processes actually entail and, and how um, uh, you know, how it's working in, in the real world and how much of it, you know, really is, uh, uh, you know, more, more on the, the red tape uh, side of things. Okay, so I have another question about uh, climate. Um, and this comes from Anthony. He's, um, he says there's been a lot of talk about uh, the concept of climate gentrification and uh, the idea that low-income, diverse communities are often vulnerable to displacement as wealthier people uh, seek higher ground that previously wasn't as desirable. Um, and do you, are you aware of any examples uh, anywhere that um, cities are using to sort of proactively attack this and uh, prevent such displacement? Yeah, it's a real problem. Um, and. Uh, uh, Miami, I guess, uh, uh, is a place that I would uh, point to, um, uh, and indeed, um, uh, the uh, the the phrase that was coined uh, regarding climate gentrification, I think, um, a Harvard professor, uh, was about places like um, uh, li uh, Little Havana, Havana, uh, uh, and. Um, uh, in other areas in, in Miami that were a little bit inland and, you know, you started to see this kind of real estate speculation and, um, and this notion of, of climate uh, fuel gentrification. Uh, a lot of other factors uh, involved there, but, but yes, that is, that, is, um, that is something that is happening. So one solution is... Uh, I, I, I wrote a piece called uh, The Riches of Resilience, which I, I can share via chat or uh, somehow otherwise get out to you. That's in uh, Landlines magazine. And it's an approach of looking at uh, the sort of the higher end real estate development, which you don't have to look very far to find in Miami. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, big new towers that benefited from uh, a zoning change, for example, uh, or a lifting of a height restriction or any government action that paves the way for a luxury tower um, is um, 
a moment where uh, the local government can say, hang on a second, uh, we, we have paved the way for this incredible increase in value. Uh, this, this is the concept of land value capture. So it can be used as a way to help fund uh, resilience infrastructure, including green infrastructure. And in those places, wealthier areas to be sure, uh, that can be the front lines of, of resilience if you kind of rethink uh, the value proposition um, of, of that kind of uh, urban real estate development. Um, and so that's one example of, of, of taking French, they're looking at everything, they, got a, they have a chief resilience officer there who's very good um, and uh, they um, have passed a bond issue uh, that is um, uh, really distributes uh, the funding throughout the many neighborhoods of, of Miami uh, and sensitive to this idea of climate gentrification. But that's one approach where uh, we can uh, recover some of the value that's created by government action uh, to fund uh, resilience efforts uh, that benefit more people. That's great. I just wanted to let you know, uh, Anthony, that we've shared your, um, the Lincoln Institute and your uh, website address with all of the attendees. Okay. And John, do you think we can get our next person on the phone here? <laughs> You're still on mute, John. <laughs> Thanks. I'm trying to be courteous because there's so many birds here. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I was going to say, we might have to take a question from the Q&A box to close out. And I think the, um, I'm trying to look for a theme here. And I think the, the other theme that I'm looking at is um, sort of, the, and this was a big thought of Jane Jacobs, I'm sure as well, is in terms of infill development within historic districts and how you can do that well. Um, how, how can you densify a city while still retaining its uh, community character. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this was the, the, the great challenge of city building. Um, it's been with us since the days of Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses, at least, and, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, well, well before that, um, uh, in Paris and other cities like that, it's sort of a quest for this uh, Goldilocks density. Um, that's uh, sort of Hong Kong on one end and uh, uh, perhaps uh, a suburban area or, or even LA on, on the other, um, that uh, a lot of it comes down to the design of density. Again, I, I go back to that uh, uh, rendering of some of the work that's being done on the North Shore um, and uh, how it can be done sensitively and how you can actually design density so that uh, it blends in uh, quite well. Um, and uh, you see this, you know, you can, you can go to some older areas, whether in New York City or Paris, and, uh, you know, wow, it's, a, it's 100 uh, persons per he hectare, and you, you, would, you kind of never know it. Uh, and so I think there are uh, uh, is a lot of promise in the area of design. Uh, and so uh, I would um, hand this over to the design professionals in your midst uh, to, uh, to continue to take on that challenge. Great, thanks. Are we getting ready to sort of wrap up, John? Do we have one more final question, do you think? Um, we have three minutes remaining before the end of this program. so. I, I don't want to be the one to pick the last one. Chris, did you see anything? <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> okay, All right. okay. Oh, we, we have from, one from Wayne Donaldson. We were trying to get him on the, on the phone here, but uh, I'll ask the question. He said that although still pending, the Federal Register announced that the Department of the Interior via the National Park Service had proposed changes to the rules for nominating properties to the National Register of Historic Places. The proposed changes would have dire consequences, privileging large landowners, allowing federal agencies to block the nominations of some properties, and removing, removing Section 106 protections from others. Under the revised regulations, by simply declining to act, federal agencies could block nominations of federally owned property to the register. What are your comments on, on this kind of um, development? 
Yeah, gee, I'm not, so th this has gone beyond my pay grade. I'm, I'm not familiar uh, with those specific uh, changes, although I, I do have just a general knowledge of uh, the current administration's uh, views on uh, the, such uh, designations um, and uh, favoring uh, certain uh, industries and, and, and landowners. Um, you know, you get the sense of a sort of a swing of the pendulum uh, uh, that, that actually can, appears to be quite severe. Um, so I can't comment on, uh, on the specifics uh, there. Um, uh, there. There are um, uh, instances, I think, uh, that, that are different for urban versus uh, rural areas. Uh, that are so important, and some of this might have to do a little bit more with uh, rural areas, uh, these designations, um, and uh, it's something that you're right to uh, be on guard about, um, uh, no question. Um, the the uh, current administration poses many challenges for cities. I guess I would just leave it at that. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, we're approaching the end of the program. I wanted to thank you, Anthony, for your time. And we did get some notes from Sacramento saying that they're sorry you couldn't come visit the city in person, but maybe soon enough you'll have a chance to do that. Can you uh, share where else people can uh, keep up with you or find more of your information? Yeah. Um, uh, so Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, it's um, on Twitter, it's at Land Policy. And then you've been kind enough to uh, include the website URL. It's lincolninst.edu, just short for Lincoln Institute. Um, and uh, we're on Facebook, uh, uh, we're on Instagram, we're uh, uh, communicating uh, as best we can. Uh, I've um, started this uh, Land Matters podcast, so people might be interested to uh, tune into that if they listen to podcasts. Um, and uh, that's the way you can keep up with all of us here at the Lincoln Institute. Great, thanks so much. And I wanted to just remind everybody who's on this session that we have three uh, whole days of exciting programming, including free happy hour events on Tuesday and Wednesday. And you can find information how to sign up on our website. And also John is sharing uh, information in the chat for how to uh, determine which uh, session you want to go in next. We have paired sessions through the rest of the day. So uh, thanks again, Anthony and John. Do you want to wrap it up? Yeah, just a reminder to uh, thank everybody and thank Anthony. And also, uh, you'll when you close this webinar room, you'll be presented with a feedback form. And we want to hear what your thoughts are about today's conference and throughout the rest of the conference. Just let us know how, how you thought everything went. So have a great day, everyone. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Anthony. Bye. Bye.